Dr. Gary Bolin here with us, he and his wife Norma, um, and he is uh, a wonderful guy. We got to meet uh, last night uh, in person for the first time, shared a meal together, uh, love what God is doing through his life, through his ministry. Um, they have uh, two children, boy and a girl, two uh, grandsons. Uh, God has blessed them greatly there. Um, God has blessed his ministry greatly, and we are uh, getting to benefit from that this morning. He has uh, been in the gospel ministry evangelism of uh, 48 and a half years. Um, and so he's at, you, you can read the rest of his bio here, 1,200 revivals and crusades, um, 75 mission trips, which by the way, um, we've had groups from our church uh, go to Romania with him uh, several times. Uh, he puts together that trip, uh, the medical mission trip to Romania. Um, he's also puts uh, together trips to the Holy Land. Uh, did you say uh, 45 or how many trips have you taken there? 45, 45 uh, trips to the Holy Land. Um, so he, he may be, you know, the guy that you need to talk to if, if you want to go. I know uh, we've been talking about that. Um, and so we are so blessed that God has led him here. And let me reiterate why we are committing ourselves to this. Um, the, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear uh, that the evangelist is a gift to the church, not the gift of evangelism. Every Christian is called to share the good news with other people. That's, that's, a, uh, that, that's clear from Jesus' own words in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. But the gift to the church is the evangelist because just like God has called me to pastor here, God has called Brother Gary to be an evangelist uh, in and out of the churches. And so God has uh, had his hand on Brother Gary and um, we get to be blessed by him and what God's doing through him. But God is also going to use us to bless him because if you remember back in 2020, uh, our evangelist brothers took a huge hit when uh, I think you mentioned that you did maybe one or two uh, uh, speaking engagements that year. Um, and so this is how God provides for them. And so we committed as a church that we would uh, we would have one in the fall, one in the spring that we would be able to sow into their uh, ministry through kingdom work there. And so we're so delighted to have Brother Gary uh, coming. Can I pray for you? And then I'll uh, turn it over to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your grace that, and your mercy that is new every morning. God, we thank you that you are already here. We thank you and we praise you with the host of heaven right now that Jesus reigns and that he still saves. So Lord, we pray that you would open up our hearts and minds through your servant Gary, that you would hide him behind the cross, that you would speak through him, that you would boldly proclaim your word through him, that we would exalt Jesus because of the message that you have given to your servant, Brother Gary. So, God, we get out of the way, and we ask you to take center stage. God, would you reveal even more who you are through the person and the work of your son, Jesus? We ask all of this in his name. Amen. Well, amen. Thank you, Brother David. I believe that's the second best in, uh, introduction I've ever had. The only one I can remember was better was I was speaking somewhere and the fellow was supposed to introduce me, didn't show up and I had to introduce myself. So I thank <laughs> Brother David for that. It's a joy to be at Highland Baptist Church. I've been in Meridian and a number of revivals over the years in the surrounding area. But my first time at, uh, at, at Highland, and I thank God for a GPS to be able to find the church. So, uh, but we made it, and it's a delight to be with you. We want you to know we love and appreciate you uh, because down through the last number of years, uh, you've been a blessing to us in our Romania ministry. Uh, we've had a number of your members to go with us. Uh, Robert Delt goes every time we go, uh, on, and uh, Dr. Greer has been. Uh, several others have been uh, with us through the years, and we're, we're grateful for that, and we, we thank you for your support in that. We've seen something north of 20,000 people come to Jesus in Romania in the last 25 years. We've been working there, and we've been able to establish about a dozen churches in various parts of the country, and uh, we love Romania. Matter of fact, I have a Romanian daughter-in-law, so uh, we'll forever be uh, have a special place in our heart for Romania. But I'm glad to, to be here. I thank you for the honor uh, of coming. I thank Brother David for the invitation. Uh, I, I just have grown to love and appreciate 
your, your pastor in the short uh, hours we've known each other. I, I appreciate his spirit, his sweet spirit. You're blessed. And I want to encourage you to follow him and uh, let him lead you to great things. There's many, many people that need Jesus. And he can use you as a catalyst for that. So I want to encourage you to follow your pastor. And I, I was a pastor uh, for a number of years before I went into evangelism over 40 years ago. And uh, it's one of the hardest jobs in all the world, but one of the greatest jobs in all the world. So let me encourage you to do that. But again, thank you for letting me come. Uh, it, it, when I preach, uh, amens are welcome. Matter of fact, it'll shorten the sermon. So I'll leave that up to you. But uh, very seriously, my heart, my heart beats for lost people to be saved. That's just the way it is. And I don't believe there's anybody in this building today by accident. Some of you may be here because somebody, you think somebody brought you or they invited you. And that may be true, but you're here because God wanted you here in his providence. And that word providence means to see beforehand and make plans accordingly. In God's providence, he brought you here to hear a, a simple preacher preach a simple message. I don't have to tell you that we're living in perilous days and perilous times. None of us have ever lived in times like we are. And I, wanna, I, I want you to think about eternity today and where you're going to spend eternity. Because these are certain uncertain days. I believe Jesus Christ could come before the end of this service. I really do. And he might. But even if he doesn't, things are so uncertain in our day that I would not dare walk out the doors of this church this morning unless I knew that I was saved, that I was born again, that my name was written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. And I want to say that as a, as a basis of introduction. And let, let me ask you, to listen and respond today as if this is the last sermon you'll ever hear, and it might be. Because one day you come to church the last time. You're going to hear your last sermon. The Holy Spirit's going to speak to your heart a final time. And you'll have one last opportunity to give your heart to Jesus. You can't show me a place in the Word of God where that's not this very morning, this very day. And I want to ask God to help me to preach as if it's the last sermon that I'll ever preach. And it might be. Because I realize I'm not young anymore. And one of these days I'm going to stand before a congregation like this and I'm going to open the Word of God one last time. And I pray that God will help me preach today as if it's my last time to preach. I want to preach very straightforward, honestly, and I'm an old-fashioned preacher. I don't apologize for that. But I want, to, I, I want to, you to look with me today at what I consider maybe the most awesome passage of Scripture in all the Bible. Because it talks about a future event that far too many people will be at. Far too many church members will be at this event. And we find it in Revelation chapter 20. If you'll take your copy of God's Word. And turn to Revelation chapter 20. And as you turn there, I'll ask you to stand as we read together this portion of God's Word. Revelation chapter 20. And we'll begin in verse 15 and we'll read down through the end of the chapter. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were just out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever, notice, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Father, we pray you'll take your word. 
lift it off the pages of our Bibles and sink it deep into our heart. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and be our most honored guest. I ask you, God, to move up and down these pew, uh, aisles and throughout these pews and touch every heart. Help me not to stand here in the, in the strength of the flesh, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, one more time for your anointing. But God, I pray your anointing upon the hearers as well as the preacher. And God, I pray that you'll not let a man, woman, boy, or girl leave this place without Jesus Christ. Lord, the consequences are too great. The reward is too great to miss the Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over this service. I declare it off limits to the evil one. And I claim souls for Christ today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Somebody asked a very brilliant Daniel Webster one day. They said, Mr. Webster, what is the greatest thought that ever crossed your mind? He thought for a moment and then he replied, the greatest thought that ever crossed my mind is that one day I will have to stand before God. What an awesome thought that is, but a biblical thought because we know from God's word that every single individual will stand before the judgment bar of Almighty God. Those of us who are born again, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven, will be before the judgment seat of Christ that Paul talks about. But those who do not know Christ will stand before the great white throne judgment. Now the last week or so we've all maybe been riveted to our TV sets as we've watched the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse and all of that and the courtroom scene and the judge and, and the lawyers and all of that. And, and, and that's kind of the background of this scripture. And I want you to picture a courtroom scene as I speak to you today about the final judgment of the court of no appeal. You see, one of these days, God's going to write the final sentence in the books of history. And all that we know is this world and this civilization will be over. No longer will the automobiles go down the highways. No longer will the airplanes fly the sky. No longer will the wheels of commerce grind away. One of these days, all that will be over and there will be a time of final judgment. And that's what I want you to notice with me this morning. The final judgment of the court of no appeal. The first thing I want you to notice from this passage is who the judge is going to be in eternity's court. Who the judge is going to be. He says there in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it. Now who is the him that verse 11 is referring to? Before I tell you who the judge is going to be, I need to tell you who the judge is not going to be. The judge in that day is not going to be yourself. Are your opinion of yourself. Now I am a full-time itinerant evangelist. I've been many, many places last almost 50 years preaching the gospel. And I've shared the gospel with a lot of people. And I've run into a lot of people and I'm amazed about people. They almost get their arms out of socket, patting themselves on the back, telling you how good they are and how wonderful they are. And they're nothing but sinners headed to hell without Jesus Christ. You see, your opinion of yourself is not going to matter in that day. Neither is the judge going to be your parents or your grandparents or some of your friends. I know parents and grandparents that I believe would give their life's blood if it could mean the salvation of their children or their grandchildren. Pastor mentioned I have two children and two grandsons. And uh, I've baptized all of them. And I've baptized my wife. I've baptized my daughter-in-law. I've baptized my whole family. But you see, I, I couldn't be saved for my family. As much as I love them, I couldn't be saved for my children or my two grandsons. Every individual has to make that decision for themselves. So the judge is not going to be one of your friends or your loved ones. Well, preacher, who's the judge going to be? Now listen carefully. My guess would be if you did a survey throughout the Southern Baptist Convention, my guess would be probably half the people would get the wrong answer to that question of who the judge is going to be in eternity's court. 
because we know that there's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Spirit. And we know that there's Jehovah God. And we know that Jesus Christ is the one who died on a cross, was buried and raised again the third day for our redemption. So there are many Southern Baptists say, well, we know Jesus is the Savior. That must mean that God the Father is the judge in eternity's court. And they would be 100% incorrect. For you see, the judge in this day is going to be none other than the one that wants to be your Savior today, the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, how do you know that? Because the Bible's real clear. In John chapter 5, verse 22, it says, The Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Acts 17, 31 says, God hath appointed a day in which he would judge the world by that man, Christ Jesus. The judge is going to be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Well, what do we need to know about this judge in eternity's court? Several things. Number one, we need to know he's omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. That means you can't fool him. You know, we preachers are pretty easy to fool. Uh, some of you folks here I can say are old enough to remember a Sears and Roebuck catalog. Amen? How many of you remember that? Getting, and I used to love when December came and November came and look at all the Christmas things. The Sears Ro these young people, what's he talking about? They don't know what a Sears and Roebuck. Anyway, the point I'm going to make is you bring a big old Bible as big as a Sears and Roebuck catalog used to be with you to church. We preachers will think you the greatest person on earth because we want to think best of everybody. But you see, you're not going to stand before the preacher. You're not going to stand before Brother David. The judge is going to know all the facts. He's going to know not only what you did and have done, he's going to know what you even thought about doing. He'll judge the intents of your heart. Everything is going to be perfect, unmitigated justice in that day because he's going to be omniscient. He's going to have all the facts. I heard about a newspaper, you know, there's not many written, uh, you know, uh, papers that print anymore. It's all on the internet and all that. And matter of fact, our state Baptist record's gone that way. And honestly, I haven't looked at it since it went that way. <laughs> you folks in Jackson need to listen. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to go to the trouble of doing that if it doesn't come in the mail. But anyway, I get several state papers that still do the written page. But anyway, I heard about a newspaper years ago that had an unusual slogan. It said, if you don't want it printed, then don't let it happen. I thought that was pretty good. But you see, when you stand before the Lord, not only don't let it happen, but don't even let it enter into your mind because he's omniscient. But then secondly, he's omnipotent. That means he's all powerful. It says, I saw the small and the great stand before God. It doesn't matter. You're going to want to escape. You can't escape. When he issues the summons for you to come, you're going to come. Can't tell you how many times, hundreds of times. During an invitation, I've watched big burly men, for example, grab hold of the back of a pew. They're under such conviction, they literally shake and, and they tremble and their knuckles turn white. They're under such conviction. But they resist God's conviction and they walk out a back door like this as if they got away from the Lord. Hey, I have news for you in this day when this judge issues the summons for you to come and stand before him, you're going to come. You might leave church without Christ, but you will not escape the judgment bar of Almighty God when he issues that summons in that day because he's omnipotent. He has the power to bring people into judgment. Not only is he omniscient, not only is he omnipotent, he's omnipresent. You can't get away from the Lord. You know, people try to run from the Lord. They try to hide from God. They try to, they, they try to not think about God. They try to avoid church. They try, to, they try to avoid the Bible. They try to avoid any semblance of God. And America's full of those today. But God's omnipresent. I love the Psalm 139. He says, if I ascend into heaven, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Folks, God's everywhere. We can't get away from him. He's omnipresent. 
And then, and then there's a fourth thing that we need to know about this judge. Not only is he omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent, I couldn't think of another O, so I'm just going to say it this way. He's going to judge fairly. I don't know if you noticed it when we read our scripture together. Two times he told us for emphasis how the judgment is going to be carried out in that day. It says, and every man was judged how? According to his works. According to his works. I love being a gospel preacher. Honestly, I don't always enjoy some of the things I have to preach. But I'm thankful that every time, every sermon I preach, before I give the invitation, I can always end with good news. That God loves you. God will forgive you. God will cleanse you. God will save you. God will restore you. I can end every sermon with good news. And I'm thankful for that. Because we live in the days of grace and mercy. But one of these days there will be no grace. There will be no mercy. There will be no forgiveness during this day. It will be over. At the end of this service, we're going to have an invitation. I'm going to ask you to invite Jesus to come into your heart. I'm going to ask you to make it public. Because that's what Jesus asked us to do. Because we live in a day where we can confess and repent of our sins and ask Christ into our heart and he'll save us. That's why I love being a gospel preacher. I can end always with good news. And so we'll ask you to do that later in our service as I conclude this message. But you see, he's going to judge fairly. You want grace? You want mercy? You want forgiveness? You want salvation? Praise the Lord, you can have it today through the Lord Jesus. I heard about a lady, is this Lauderdale County? Probably from Pike County where I live. She went one day, this was some years ago, she went and had her picture made down to the photography studio. And uh, this was back in the day when, you know, several days later you got it back. They, they mailed it to you. And so she was so excited. She had fixed herself up real good to go get that picture made, and she was excited to get that picture back. And the day came when it arrived. Man, she tore into it frantically, and she looked at it, and of course it looked just like her, but she did not like it. <laughs> she goes back down to the photography studio and tells the man there, listen, you need to do this thing again. He said, why? She said, because it doesn't do me justice. He looked at her and he looked at it. He said, lady, you don't need justice. What you need is mercy. <laughs> Amen. Hey, folks, listen. I don't, I don't want what I deserve because I deserve justice. I deserve hell because I'm a sinner and I rebelled against God. But thank God for his mercy, for his forgiveness, for his grace, for his mercy. Thank God for his salvation. Thank God that our God is a God who loves folks like us enough to redeem us. All right, we've looked at the judge in eternity's court. Let's look, secondly, at the defendants. Who's going to be at the great white throne judgment? Well, the Bible says it like this. I saw the small and the great stand before God. Now, who are the small and the great? That means some are small in stature and others are too big like me. No, that's not the small and great he's talking about. It's talking about all kind of people who are lost without Jesus. That's the small and the great. But I think we can put them in some broad categories to explain what the Bible's talking about here. I believe it's talking about, first of all, that, that group that's anti-God, anti-Bible, the reprobate, the agnostic, the atheist, those who hate God, hate the Bible, hate preachers, hate churches, hate Christians. And have you noticed America's full of them? Amen? God will have the last word 
Fret not thyself because of evildoers, the Word says. But the out and out sinner is going to be there. Well, honestly, there's nobody like that that I'm preaching to today. Because if you were in that category, you would, certainly wouldn't be in God's house. You wouldn't even want to drive by the street, by the church, much less come inside. So let's just set them aside because God's going to take care of them. But there's a second group that will be there. Not only the out and out sinner, but there's, a, there's the uh, self-righteous will be there. Now, who are the self-righteous preacher? The self-righteous are those who think they're going to heaven on their own merit. They're the ones who think they're religious enough and good enough to get to heaven without being born again. There's lots of people like that. There's lots of people like that. They are depending on their human goodness. If you had witnessed as many people as I have, you're going to find out that the majority of people will tell you, well, I'm, I'm better than those people that go to that church up there, and I help my neighbor, and I help the hungry, and I, I help the dis destitute, and I do all that, and we ought to do that. But folks, that's not going to get you to heaven. That'll be an outflow of your salvation, not a means to your salvation, which is impossible. And so, the self-righteous will be there. Jesus encountered them. They were called scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. He said, you clean the outside of the platter, but on the inside it's full of dead men's bones. You're like a whitewashed sepulcher, whitewashed gravestone. Looks good on the outside, but in the inside it's full of death. The self-righteous will be there. And then there's a third group that will be there, and that is church members who've never been saved. Now, I want you to hear me and hear me well. Folks, I have seen thousands of church members saved in my ministry. Doesn't mean they're wicked people, as we count ungodliness. Doesn't mean they're bad citizens. Matter of fact, some of them are some of the best people you'll know. They've just never been born again. Somebody asked one of the greatest preachers ever to preach, Dr. George W. Truett, who pastored First Baptist Dallas, President of the Southern Baptist Convention back in the 30s or so, about 80 years ago, give or take. Back then, when people lived a lot more conservative, godly lives than they do today, this was back before soap operas. Hello. This was back before television and all this kind of stuff. People live a lot more conservative lives than they do now by far. They asked George W. Truett, they said, Dr. Truett, what percentage of church members would you estimate have never been saved? This great man of God, one of the greatest preachers ever, said, I'd estimate that at least 60% of church members have never been saved. Did you know that people like Billy Graham through the years that said 80% or, or more have never been saved? Folks, I don't have a clue the percentage of church members who've never been saved. But I'll tell you, it's way too many. It's far too many. And we wonder why churches are so dead. We wonder why churches are so lifeless. Folks, they're filled with dead people. I'm going to tell you, if you've got Jesus in your heart, you've got a different spirit in you. You've got peace in your heart. You've got joy in your heart. You've got excitement about the Lord God in your heart. Man, you can't get a holy grunt out of some of these folks in church anymore. Amen. And so church members who've never been saved. That sweet lady, she's sitting right over here. She, she's going to get mad at me for doing this. But I don't care. I'm talking about my wife, by the way. Her daddy was a uh, Presbyterian, the son of a Presbyterian preacher. Her mama was Episcopalian. And so when she was a little girl, she joined the Episcopalian church uh, and uh, did everything the Episcopalian said do to go to heaven when you die. Had a beautiful confirmation ceremony. She also joined the Presbyterian church and did everything the Presbyterian said do to go to heaven when you die. When we were engaged to be married, wanted to be a, a faithful wife, she walked down the aisle of the New Zion Baptist Church, Route 1, Liberty, Mississippi, one Sunday morning. 
and joined the Southern Baptist Church, and my pastor took her down to the coal of Mitt River and baptized her. Never been a sweeter, never been a kinder, never been a more godly person that God's ever made. But if she had died before June 1973, the very week that I was going through my final decision to surrender to the ministry, if she'd have died before June 1973, she'd have went straight to hell, surrounded by baptismal certificates, offering envelopes, evangelism certificates, and all the rest. She had been through wind schools. She had been through evangelism explosions. She knew more about winning people to Jesus than most preachers I work with. But she didn't know Jesus. She kept having doubts about her salvation. And so one day she said, honey, would you show me how to be saved? <laughs> she knew how to be saved. But I took her down the Roman road, plan of salvation. I shared the gospel with her at our home in Clinton, Mississippi. She went in the back room, got on her knees, asked God to forgive her of her sins, asked Jesus to come into her heart. This was June 1973. We went immediately the next few weeks to New Orleans Seminary where I got a Master of Divinity degree. And I was having my last revival, Brother David is a pastor. September 1979, almost six and a half years later, and during that revival, now folks, I'm the pastor. Y'all understand? You know what's going to send a lot of people to hell? Pride. They're so worried about what somebody else in church is going to think about them rather than what God knows about them. That's so silly. She said, honey, I know I've been saved since June 1973. But you know, I've never had believer's baptism. Uh-oh. What do you think I ought to do? I said, baby, you need to do what the Lord leads you to do. I knew you would anyway. And I don't know, it's like Monday night, maybe, of that revival. I, uh, the, the evangelist gave the invitation, and I looked up, and there came, comes my wife down the aisle. Man, I'm the preacher. Just like the devil sitting on my shoulder saying, all right, big boy, what are you going to tell that congregation now? Folks, I've always had a pretty good understanding with the devil. I don't give a rip what he thinks. And let me tell you something else. You better not be intimidated by what church people think. Or you're going to have a miserable life. All that really matters is what God knows about you. Hello? Are y'all understanding what I'm saying to you? Don't you let some church member's intimidation send you to hell. Don't let your pride send you to hell. And she made her profession of faith. I baptized her. Before the week was out, I baptized 18 of my church members in the same situation. All adults. Folks, listen. You got to do it the right way. You got to do it God's way or it's not going to hold up in eternity. And so church members who've never been saved will be there. And then there's one last group, and I mentioned it earlier, and that's procrastinators. Procrastinators. I'm talking about spiritual procrastinators. I'm talking about people who say, I, I know I'm lost, I need to be saved, but I'll get saved one of these days. I've been preaching a long time, folks, 48 and a half years. I preached to a lot of folks by God's grace. I pastored three churches full time. Do you know how many procrastinators I can name for you that I've seen saved? That said, I'm lost. I need to be saved. I'll be saved one of these days, but I'm just not going to get saved today. Do you know how many procrastinators I can name to you I've seen saved? Out of at least two, three million people I've preached to. I can name you one. I can name you one. One young man in the last church I pastored who put off being saved, who procrastinated, who later got saved and I baptized him. I, I can't name you of a, another single procrastinator. And if you're here today and you say, I'm lost and I need to be saved, I'm going to be saved one day. And if you don't do it today, you're probably going to hell. 
because there will not be a better time than right now. That's why the Bible says today when you hear his voice, harden not your heart. That's why it says, behold, now is the accepted time. That's why it says today is a day of salvation. This is the time. This is the place. This is the opportunity. And if you can't get saved under a message like this, you, you, you probably never will. All right, lastly, we've looked at the judge in eternity's court. We've looked at the people that will be at the great white throne judgment. Lastly, let's look at the nature of the trial. The nature of the trial. In any court of law, there are about four elements. Number one, the evidence is presented. Number two, the defendant has an opportunity to mount his or her defense. Number three, the verdict of the court is handed down. And number four, the verdict of the court is carried out. Now let's suppose it's the time that we read about in Revelation chapter 20. And one by one by one by one, people are coming to stand before the Lord Jesus. And let's suppose it's your time. And here you are, face to face, eyeball to eyeball with the Son of God. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 that he has eyes as a flame of fire. That means he can look through you. And here you are face to face with Jesus. It's going to be that time the old black spiritual talks about. When it says, I went to the rock to hide my face. And the rock cried out, no hiding place, no hiding place down here. You're going to want to hide. You're going to want to run, but you can't. And he's going to look at you with those piercing eyes. And he's going to ask you a question, such a simple question. And obviously, he's already going to know the answer. He's going to say, why did you reject me? Why did you not receive me? Why did you not let me save you? I loved you so much. I took your sin, your rebellion, and I died in blood and agony on an old rugged cross and shed my blood for you. And I was buried and raised again the third day. Yet you would not receive me as Savior. Why? Why didn't you let me save you? I just hear this excuse. Well, Lord, I tell you why I'm not saved. Lord, it's that church crowd. Why they had Baptists, they had Methodists, they had Presbyterians, they had Church of God, they had Church of Christ, they had Catholics, they had Episcopalians, uh, they had Pentecostals. Why, why, Lord, I just couldn't make up my mind what church to join. He's going to say, I didn't say believe on the church. I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, Lord, I tell you why I'm not saved. Why, Lord, it's that Highland Baptist Church. Lord, there's hypocrites down there in that church. He going to say, do say, tell him something else he don't know. Can I let you in on a little secret, folks? There's hypocrites in every church in the world. Amen? And if you wait till you find a church that doesn't have hypocrites in it, you punch your ticket to hell because there's no such place. I'm like the black preacher. I'd much grow to, rather go to church and be with the hypocrites some of the time than I had to go to hell and be with them all the time. Amen? Sure, there's hypocrites in your church. There's hypocrites in my church in Macomb. There's hypocrites everywhere. But you're not going to stand before God for somebody else. But I want to tell you something else about the church. Some of the best people in Meridian, Mississippi are sitting out here today too. And in God's churches around town and other places. You got to get your eyes off of people. You got to get your eyes on Jesus. I like eggs. What in the world's that got to do with a sermon? Well, I tell you what, some time back, my wife went to the store and bought a dozen eggs. And I told her to fix me a couple of eggs for breakfast. And, and would you believe one of those 12 eggs was a hypocrite? It was bad. But you know what? I'm still eating eggs. Because <laughs> I like eggs. Folks, I'm not going to quit on God's church because there's a bunch of... They, well, I'm going to say it that way. 
I'm not going to put on God because there's some frauds and fakes and hypocrites in church. Because most of them are good people who love him. He's going to say, I didn't say believe on the hypocrites. I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, Lord, I tell you why I'm not saved. It, it's, it's that brother David Hopkins. Lord, he invited one of them evangelists to come to preach in our church on Sunday morning. And he got up there and he preached against sin. And he preached on judgment. And Lord, I don't like that kind of preaching. Lord, I like to be made to feel good when I go to church. Y'all have all heard of Billy Sunday, the great evangelist. Those old time preachers make us look so vanilla in our preaching. I'm telling you, they really did get down on it. But anyway, Billy Sunday was doing a crusade somewhere and he was getting down on it real good to such an extent. Some of the men called him off the side and told him, said, hey, Billy said, you need to ease up just a little bit. You're rubbing the fur on the old cat the wrong way. He said, let me tell you something. That old cat's headed toward hell. If she'd turn around, I'd be rubbing it the right way. Folks, I want to tell you something. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about the difference between heaven and hell. We're talking about all God's ever had to work with is a bunch of sinners. We need to understand what the Word of God says. There's going to be a judgment one day. And there are going to be a lot of unprepared people at the great white throne judgment wish, wishing they could have one more opportunity to give their heart to Christ, which they'll never have at that point. He's going to say, I didn't say believe on the preacher. I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, Lord, I'll tell you why I'm not saved. And y'all, excuse me, this makes me want to throw up. I've heard this one so much. Lord, I'll tell you why I'm not saved. I wanted to wait till I could live it. Brother David, you've heard that one. I wanted to wait till I could live it. Can I let you in on a little secret? You can't live it. I can't live it. That's why we need Jesus to help us to... I mean, even in some way, come close to being Christ-like. We need Him in us. We need His Spirit. We need to be guided by His Word if we're going to live for Him. He's going to say, I didn't say believe on yourself. I said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And one by one by one by one by one, you're going to give all your excuses. Finally, you're going to run out of excuses. Recording angel is going to be standing over here and he's going to turn to Jesus and he's going to say, Master, what shall I write by that man's name? Master, what shall I write by that woman's name? Master, what shall I write by that teenager's name? And I believe with all my heart, with tears, the Lord Jesus is going to say, write L-O-S-T, lost, lost beyond help, lost beyond hope, and lost throughout eternity. And at that very moment, the sentence of the court will be carried out because verse 15 says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. At that moment, the foul spirits of hell will reach up and drag your spirit, your soul down to hell forever and ever and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever. And it doesn't have to be. But it will be. Unless you turn from your sins. And ask the Lord Jesus to come into your heart. I close with this little one minute story. I'm trying to get across what I'm trying to say to you today. Little Jimmy went to Sunday school. This was back in my day when I grew up, a long time ago. And that particular day, the lesson was on the omnipotence, the all-powerfulness of God. And the teacher had studied so hard and worked so hard through the week because she wanted to convey to those students about our great God and how omnipotent, all-powerful he was. And so she poured her heart out for about 30, 35 minutes or whatever the time was. And so at the end of the class, she decided she'd find out if they got the message or not. So she posed this question. She said, class, is there anything, is there anything that God cannot do? Immediately, little Jimmy's hand flew up in the air. Startled the teacher, omnipotent God, all-powerful God, something he can't do. 
And in a perplexed way, she turned to Jimmy and said, well, what is it, son, that God can't do? I love little Jimmy's answer. He said, teacher, God cannot see my sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Woo, glory to God, that ought to make a Baptist shout. Amen? Aren't you thankful? Hallelujah, you're right. Hallelujah. He cannot see our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to stand with me. And I want you to do something with me as we come to our time of invitation. I want you to recite a verse of Scripture with me. You'll know it. If you know any verse, you're going to know this one. As I begin to recite it, I want you to join in with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me ask you to do something. And let me ask, please, that nobody leave the sanctuary unless it's an emergency. Because we're at the most important part of our service, our invitation. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Now, I'd like to ask you to do something for me. I can ask. I certainly cannot demand. I'd like to ask you to be honest. Let me tell you how honest I'd like to ask you to be. I'd like to ask you to be as honest as you're going to have to be one day when you stand before God. And that's real honest. And being as honest as you're going to have to be one day when you stand before God. While nobody's looking, I'm not. Brother David's not. No one else is looking on except God himself. How many of you could say to omniscient, all-knowing God, Lord, I know that 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 I know. If I were to drop dead right now, I know I'd go to heaven. I know my name is written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. Lord, I know I'm saved. If you could say that with 100% certainty, while only God looks on. Would you just lift your hand up and put it back down, please? Thank you very much. I'm sure that there were numbers of hands raised, but I'm also sure that probably numbers of hands could not be raised. I'd like to ask you to do a second thing this morning. Again, I ask, I cannot demand. I'd like to ask you not only to be honest with the Lord, I'd like to ask you to be honest with me. Now, I realize most of you don't know me. I'm just a preacher who showed up this morning. But I give you my word of honor. That's all I have. I don't have anything else. I give you my word of honor. I would not do anything to embarrass you. I would not do anything that you would not want me to do. But at the same time, if you don't trust me, I can't help you get to Jesus today. And so I'd like to ask you not only to be honest with the Lord, I'd like to ask you to be honest with me. Because I'd like the privilege, special privilege of praying for you to settle the destiny of your soul today and where you're going to spend eternity. If you would allow me simply to pray for you throughout the congregation, you'd say, Brother Gary, pray for me. I need to settle it today where I'm going to spend eternity. And I'd like to ask you, as a preacher of the gospel, to pray for me. If you'd allow me to pray for you, would you just slip your hand up, please, wherever you are? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Preacher, pray for me. God bless you. Thank you. In the balcony, preacher, pray for me. God bless you. Others. In the choir. In the choir. Preacher, pray for me that I might settle it before it's everlastingly too late. We've had numbers of hands. Anyone else? Preacher, pray for me. I'll wait another 10 seconds. Anyone else? You may, God bless you. Thank you. You see, the first step to being saved is being honest. God doesn't save anybody that won't admit they're lost. Anyone else? Quickly, before I pray. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. Praise God. Amen. Someone else? Preacher, pray for me. 
Heavenly Father, God, the best way I know how I lift up these have just raised their hands that they need to be saved. They need to settle it before it's too late. Oh, dear God, with all my heart, Lord, with everything that's in me, Lord, I lift them up to you. God, I don't know their name, but you do. I don't know anything about them, but you know everything. And God, I thank you for their honesty. I thank you for their courage just to slip their hand up and say, I need Jesus today. I pray for them, God. I pray that in a moment when we pray that they'll pray and let you save them and be born again. Lord, I pray for them with all my heart in Jesus' name. Now listen carefully. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you just raised your hand a moment ago and said, I need to settle it today where I'm going to spend eternity. Or you, you should have raised your hand that you did not. Listen carefully. I want to lead you in a simple, simple prayer you can pray. I promise you on the authority of the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of the living God. If you will pray this prayer and mean it with all your heart, not your head, but with all your heart, I promise you, Jesus will save you. Preacher, I'm willing to do that. All right, listen carefully, very carefully. I'm going to lead you in this prayer by praying aloud. And I'm going to allow you ample time as I lead you in this prayer to pray this prayer silently or aloud, your choice, from your heart to God's heart. And as I lead you in this prayer, if you'll simply pray this prayer and mean it with your whole being, with your whole heart, you can be saved today. Preacher, I'm willing to do that. All right, pray with me right now. Let's do it. Just say, Dear God. Lord, you know my heart. You know everything about me. Nothing is hid from you. Most of all, Lord, you know I'm a sinner. I've done many things wrong. And Lord, the best way I know how, I come right now to ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Lord, the best way I know how, I don't want to stay like I am any longer. And God, the best way I know how, I turn from my sins in repentance. I turn my back on my old way of life. Lord, forgive me and cleanse me of every sin. And now, Lord Jesus, by faith, trusting in you and only in you to save me, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Jesus, I receive you as Savior and Lord of my life. Save me right now. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, for dying for me, and for saving me. Now, Lord, help me not be ashamed of you, because you are not ashamed of me. With his bowed and eyes closed, listen carefully. If you prayed that prayer and you really, really meant it, would you look up here at me? Did you mean it? Did you mean it? Look at me. If you really meant it, I want you to meet me right here. I want to have a word with you. I want to have a prayer with you. Just step out right now. Come on. That's right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Some of you from the back need to come. If you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, I'm going to ask you to come. Amen. Come on. Come on. Others need to come. At least seven, eight others need to come. Some adults need to come. If you pray and ask Christ to save you, would you come right now? Amen. Come on. Don't have to have pretty music playing to get saved. Amen. Sir, what about you? Madam, what about you? Other young people? There's some other young people. I remember what one of the greatest preachers in Christian history said, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He said, you and your sins must separate. Are you and your God will never come together. Folks, sin and Jesus don't coexist real good. He's either got to be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. 
I believe there's others who need to come besides these three. Anyone else? Quickly. I'm going to wait about 30 more seconds. Christians be praying. There's many others need to come. Come on to Jesus right now. Step out. Take the first step. He'll walk with you. Come on right now. Come on to Jesus. That's right. Come on. Come on. Did you really mean it when you raised your hand you need to settle it? Or were you playing a church game? That's a road to a hardened heart. That's a road to a hardened heart. Anyone else? Quickly. Y'all look at me. Did y'all really mean that? Did y'all ask God to forgive you of your sins? You really meant it? You asked Jesus to come into your heart? Of course, that means he is now. How long is he going to stay there? To we say the benediction? How about forever and ever and ever? Isn't that good? Amen. Does it feel better inside? Amen. God bless y'all. Father, thank you for these three precious young people, Lord. I pray you'll bless them. I pray you'll make mighty, mighty warriors for the kingdom out of them, Lord. Help them to share with other young people what's happened to them that can happen to them, Lord. Bless them, I pray in Jesus' name. Would y'all be seated over here on the pew, please? Miss Abby and the choir is going to lead us. Brother David will be here. Perhaps you're here today as a believer. God's spoken to your heart. And you say, I need to be more to Jesus than I've ever been before. And I need to come in a, in a full surrender to the Lordship of Christ. I need to make this my church home. I need to come to, for believer's baptism like Ms. Bolin did. Because I know I'm saved, but I hadn't been baptized since I really got saved. Whatever that decision is, as they lead us, would you come right now? Brother David would be here. Would you come?